and between the NIE about how really badly everything is going in Iraq and some of the people who chose to unburden themselves at this point about uh, dysfunction in this White House. Uh, is the view of Bush world now different than the one that you had? Because your book, in a way, was the, the first. I mean, Maure Maureen's column has been pretty relentlessly both on target but very critical of uh, Bush world. Uh, <laughs> You know, now you're starting to six year sixth year of this presidency really see people who were silent for a long time begin to speak out and has it changed your picture of Bush world or what do you think exactly is going on is it imploding or not uh, um, from the beginning for me I think um, I'm not, you know, people who, who want to dispute what's in my column will say, oh, that's just psychobabble, but I'm not really so much into psychobabble, you know? I, I've never been to a shrink, not that there's anything wrong with it. And I come from an Irish family, you know, and we're, we're all um, kind of very obsessively close and talk to each other about our problems. But I do think there's almost no other way to analyze this presidency except in terms of the classic father-son relationship that I have studied in Shakespeare and you see in Joseph Campbell and Star Wars. Uh, you know, the dark father and the light father with Cheney being Darth Vader and his own father, you know, being the sort of lighter father. And, uh, you know, Woodward's book only just confirms this because I've always wondered why would W hire Donald Rumsfeld when Donald Rumsfeld spent so much time back in the day trying to destroy Bush Sr.'s career. That's why he recommended he be the CIA director, because he thought that would get him off track for a presidential run. And he just thought he was wimpy and flighty and a patrician and shouldn't be president. And he, Donald Rumsfeld, was the tough ex-wrestler infighter who should be president. So I, I was just thinking to myself, if I were president, why would I appoint a guy who really tried to hurt my dad if I really love my dad? It, that just didn't make sense. And it's so interesting to see Woodward, you know, actually come right out and say that part of the appeal of Rumsfeld to W and part of his staying appeal is the fact that, um, you know, his dad thought he was an authoritarian bully who didn't listen to anyone. So W not only didn't ask his dad before he went and waged the same war with the same dictator, uh, you know, his dad who had spent his whole life on foreign affairs, but he was appointing people just because he thought he could prove his dad wrong, just the same way he wanted to go into Iraq, just to prove he could upend his dad. And I know they love each other and everything, but the unspoken rivalry of a child, an oldest son, who drifts into his 40s and is always dwarfed by the shadow of his father, you know, has, has shaped all of our lives in really deleterious ways, I think. So, um, you know, Woodward, I, I was telling Jill, this morning that when Bushworld came out, I was on the George Stephanopoulos show and, and Woodward was on the panel with me and afterwards he came in the green room and he sat down and he said, uh, you know, I think your view of Bush and Cheney is, is way too negative. You know, they're not that bad. So now his view has come around to my view, so I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> Maureen would, would love to just answer your questions, and I know it's difficult, I know, because a lot of people are, are out on the, the, the curb, but if you, if you sort of speak up, I, what I'll do is I'll try to repeat the question so everyone uh, can hear it and then have Maureen answer. Is that if you okay? It, if you could give it crazy. Yeah, yeah. sure. And if um, anybody has questions for Jill. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yes, I, I, uh, an observation is that, that Washington Week has done a good job of introducing women as commentators, and in my view, an especially good group. 
Uh, would you comment on that? And has the, has that played in a, has that play a role? I mean, that fact played a role. In I, I'm going to the question was just the show Washington Week on PBS that now has a female host, Gwen Ifall, and has been a showcase even going back to the days when Paul Duke was the moderator of trying to uh, give prominent roles to women uh, commentators on TV, whether it's Linda Greenhouse, who covers the Supreme Court for the Times, has been on that show, and Karen Tumulty, who covers politics for Time, and whether having that show as a showcase for women is part of a brightening trend for women on television. Well, the funny part about this is that there have been a lot of stories coming out recently that men are vanishing in newsrooms across the country, that, that women are taking over. There's so many women on TV. So really, it was just what Roger Ailes calls the Mount Olympus, which is the network news uh, anchor spot that was they were hesitant to give to a woman. And when I was writing my book, it was right around the time of, that they were thinking of giving it to Elizabeth Vargas. And I happened to run into a guy at the top of ABC Disney who would have control of this decision. And I said to him, would you think about giving it to Elizabeth Vargas? And he goes, oh, of course, Elizabeth Vargas is great. Of course, we would love to have her be the anchor. And then he paused and he goes, but what if, what if there was another 9-11? That could be a problem. And so I said, oh, you mean you'll give it to a woman if no news breaks out? <laughs> and he said, yeah. He goes, then we could bring in a guy, you know. And it's the daddy in the chair thing, which you have as president, too, especially in the era of terrorism. They're just thinking, in a crisis, we need a daddy in a chair. And that's what Katie is sort of confronting, you know, can she be the daddy in the chair? Or do we need just a mommy in the chair? And in a way, this was something um, you saw also in the uh, Clinton re-election campaign when Naomi Wolf came up with the theme for Clinton, which she ran on, of, of the good father, it was called. The good father who protects the home from invaders. That was the subtext of his campaign, and that was before terrorism. So now that we actually have invaders trying to get into the home, and the whole, you know, I go into this in the last chapter, and this to me is the most interesting part of the book, the way gender is the subtext of every political campaign. In every political campaign, the Republicans have been more successful if they have been able to make the Democrats seem effeminate. And it might seem so blatant that you think voters would see through it, this whole cut and run, or John Kerry's a flip-flopper. It's all like phrases meant to imply impotence. And uh, they did the same thing with Al Gore, but it's, you know, they, uh, they operate at a visceral level, and oftentimes the Democrats are operating at this cerebral level. And that visceral level, I think, especially in the age of terrorism, is very successful. But, um, I don't know, you know, uh, at the Times, I, I think um, I have a chapter in the book about how geneticists say that the Y chromosome is going to, you know, is shedding genes kind of willy-nilly and is going to go out of business in about 100,000 <laughs> years or, or 10 million, depending on which geneticist you listen to. And I'm thinking, so in 100,000 years, we're going to have all female columnists at the time, so it's going to be so great. <laughs>